everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're going to have some fun talking to you about a, a really exciting way for MLSs to become even more viable and even more relevant than they are. Um, before we start, just I'd love to say, a, a, everybody say a quick prayer for all of our folks down in uh, Louisiana. Greater Southern MLS, one of our clients is in Lake Charles. They are right in the center of it, and it's almost a Cat 5. There's 250,000 people without power right now. So any one of you that runs MLSs knows what that might feel like. So let's just, let's let's pull for them. Uh, anyway, love to, let's just get this rolling. So, you know, the, the rental area for MLSs is, is, is certainly a great opportunity to continue to expand the types of information that, that uh, you guys aggregate and that you clean and make a really available and help people, especially in markets, which I know many of them are like right now where inventory is so tight. Uh, rentals can be a way for people to still generate some revenue in the meantime before the you know houses start to come back on the market. So um, I'm excited to to talk today about Rental Beast. This is a, a product that I know some of you probably are already working with. Chris Haran has been with them for many years. In fact, it sounds like he's made Ishai what he is today because he keeps pushing on him to do better and better stuff, <laughs> which doesn't surprise me knowing you, Chris. Um, so let's let's just jump in. So let's go to the next slide. I just want to remind everybody. Um, we love it when you ask questions. Um, the, the presentation gets even more um, interesting and targeted. I know many of you have great insights about what what you know rentals might look like with MLSs today. So just click on the, the gray bar, um, click on that little triangle that says questions and open it up and then just feel free to ask whatever. And we'll ask it either right in the context when you, in, when you pose it or toward the end. So if you don't hear it right away, hold on, because we will probably try to still answer it. So let me introduce our great panelists that we've got with us today. We've got Ishai Greenberg. He, Greenberg, excuse me. He's the uh, the founder and CEO of Rental Beast, um, and has a terrific understanding of how our industry works, and particularly ways that um, we can specifically address the needs that rentals have. You know, there's when we look at an MLS system that's for residential sales. Um, and then we look at Rental Beast, you see that this has been uniquely designed for the unique nuances and, and information needs that you have when you're dealing with rentals, which can be very different than residential sales, obviously. And then we have Chris Haran, many of you I'm sure know him. Uh, he is the CTO for MRED in Chicago. Uh, he is also has a, a, long backridge, a long background in brokerage as well as MLS and is, in my not so humble opinion, I think is one of the most progressive and thought provoking guys we've got in our industry. So thank you, Chris, for being here today. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to them. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit of a quick poll, and then we're going to talk about, you know, the role that MLSs can play within rentals. It's, you know, it's always been something that MLSs do, but not, it's never really been the priority or the full-time role. And Frankly, sometimes inventory with rentals gets a little light because we don't have everything we need, but these guys have, have found a way to address that. So it's, I'm really excited for you to see it because, of, as you know, we're always trying to find ways to make MLSs more comprehensive, more relevant, more meaningful, and particularly more customer-centric, and I think this is a great tool to do that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Ishai, and take it away. All right, great. And I think we are starting with a poll question. So, Michael? I refer to as Oz because he's behind the curtain. So you can put that up. So what um, percentage of American renters plan to buy a home in the next five years? This is, a, a, I guess, a guess for us to figure out what that number is, right? I guess so. Yeah. I mean, I, I've received the answers in advance, so I do know the answer to that. But just thought it would be a good, uh, a good place to start because it ties nicely into um, what I'm going to cover next is before we talk about uh, talk about the specific challenges that we've kind of heard from MLSs on why they haven't become the, the kind of the central marketplace that they already are on the sales side of the business, uh, I thought it'd be important to address why rentals are of critical importance. Um, and hopefully the, the folks that are participating on, on this webinar have already kind of acknowledged that, but, um, but wanted to give some facts and kind of back, back that up. Okay, uh, we've had almost uh, three quarters of the audience has voted, so why don't we reveal that answer, or or, or, and, or you can tell us the answer, Ishai. Well, the answer is C, 56%. Wow, that's a lot. That's more than I would have thought. Yeah, um, so, so, so I, I guess kind of sneak preview, 
being in rentals doesn't just mean that you um, tap into kind of a new and different type of business, but it feeds directly into the core business of what agents and brokers are focused on, which is, of course, selling homes. Um, so kind of why rentals? Why do we think rentals are important? You know, if, if you guys have been on a demo with me or if you've ever spoken to me, you, you've heard this speech. It's updated with uh, the latest and greatest statistics, but uh, I always like to open that way to kind of try and focus the conversation. So for starters, you know, rentals are not a niche market. And, uh, and I know I've, I've come to the business from being a real estate agent and a managing broker for 20 years. So everything we do is kind of from that perspective of an agent and, 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 and how that works for them. So almost half of the population is renting. It's 40% nationally in, in the key urban markets and all the NFL cities, it's 60% plus. That translates to about 113 million people renting in the US today. That's by the way, up from 110 million people last year at the same time. And what it looks like from an inventory perspective is we need 4.6 million new rental units by 2030 just to keep up with demand. I think it's becoming even more important in this type of environment because supply is very constrained on the sales side, or at least so we hear in many, many markets. So when a person needs an alternative housing solution and you can't help the full 50% of the population, it's problematic. While there is always need for more supply on rentals, it's not nearly as severe as it is on the sales side, and it actually creates this really positive dynamic of commission payouts to real estate agents. And I don't think many realize how big the market opportunity is, but we cover in our own kind of rental MLS database now nearly 9 million rental properties, which in turn provides access to about $12 billion in leasing commissions annually. Of course, if an MLS does not have kind of comprehensive rental inventory or the rental inventory that they have doesn't really cover the commission payouts um, accurately or properly, you don't get access to that. But that's kind of one of the big problems we're trying to solve. It's a very big commission pocket that we want to make available to real estate agents. The other thing that um, I think is interesting is when you look at what's really driven the sales market for the past 30 or 40 years, it's been that boomer generation. And for the most part, the boomers are done buying unless it's really a second or a third home. When they sell their houses, 10% of them move into rentals. And about a third of all rental applications in the past few years processed in the key urban markets have been processed for renters that are 60 plus years old. Um, it just creates this environment where you have very affluent renter base. So if you're in a downtown area and you see these big luxury buildings coming up, those buildings are often geared towards these boomers that have a ton of equity in their homes and they're downsizing because the kids left or they're sick of the maintenance, but they, they, they're interested in having somebody else be the landlord for a while. And I have a question about that. Do you sure. see any changes in these trends with COVID? Are we, are, or is this rental growth continuing regardless? The rental, the rental market has experienced changes in what type of properties people are looking for. So I think in some, for example, if you look at the New York City market, um, you know, every market is a little different. New York City, people, because every, everything is so congested and it's a very vertical market, the demand for rental has grown, but it's grown a little further out of the city, maybe in single family rentals and in the suburbs and mm -hmm. further into Brooklyn and Queens and less so in kind of the downtown area. People want more space. People are not commuting mm -hmm. to the office anymore. You look at the Boston market, it's been heavily infected by COVID because it's a very college driven market. So 60% of all the leases in where we're based in Boston are down for college students that start the semester usually on September 1st. A lot of college students are not coming back for, uh, for this year's semester. So um, that reduced demands downtown. But you know, I own rentals in Boston that are a little bit further away from downtown. And even though I was really kind of scared and worried about this year and my ability to lease it, I've had a really easy time leasing it totally virtually without having to do any showings. Um, and actually was able to get higher rent than last year. So I think it, the demand is there, but the demand may have shifted to different types of properties and maybe mm -hmm. kind of spread out a little bit further into the suburbs than it, than it was. 
which is uh, actually pretty good for MLSs because a lot of MLSs would have more of those single, you know, doubles, triples, quad types of inventory as opposed to high rises generally. Yeah, and, and even in our database, 80% of the inventory and 80% of the inventory in the country is what's defined as long tail of supply. So it's not this big multifamilies that represent 20%. It's much smaller management companies, almost half the inventory is mom and pops, um, small private landlords. And, uh, and that's, that, that's the lion's share of, of all rental inventory in the country. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so, so kind of why is that important that, that the boomers are kind of done and, and, and millennials are taking their place? So I think everybody understands that what's driving the sales market today are these millennials. They're about 40% of the buy population and growing. And that same group of people represents 65% of the rental population. So, so what this graph shows, this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, is what's the propensity of these millennials to rent relative to all prior generations or to the three prior generations. And reality is that these millennials are just flat out three times more interested in renting than any generation before them. So in order to capture that millennial as an actual customer, you really have to, in our opinion, build that relationship with them while they're renting and, uh, and they represent the lion's share of the renting population. And to share some numbers, and these are really updated statistics um, from, from the past 30, 60 days. So 40, 14% of millennials believe that they're gonna rent for life, but despite COVID, meaning this, these statistics already uh, account for the COVID impact, 62% um, of the younger millennials, meaning the kind of the first or second quartile of them, um, and 68% of the older millennials plan to buy within the next five years. So, to us, mission critical to build a relationship with them. And the nice thing about rentals and the lifetime value of the customer you did when they rent is, when I was buying and selling homes for folks, the, the transaction is very infrequent depending on the market that happens every seven to 11 years. On rentals, as soon as you put a customer into a rental, you have a lease expiration date. So there is effectively a, a timer that starts ringing on a certain date and 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days out, um, they have to start thinking about, do I want to renew my lease? Do I want to move to a new rental? Or am I ready now to get pre-approved and purchase a property? And if you have the right tools, you convert a lot of them into a buy side transaction. And, and in our particular platform, we track about a 30% conversion of renters that turn into a buy side transaction. So another way to look at being in the rental business, in addition to those $12 billion in commissions is, Instead of buying or competing for active buyers, you're building a relationship with someone a month, a year, two years, three years before they're ready to buy, but you actually got paid for that lead instead of paying for it um, you know, through the usual suspects. How affluent are these renters, right? So there is this notion a lot of agents have that people rent because they can't afford to um, and they can't get qualified to buy. And that hasn't been the case for a really long time. This is a 10-year study that was done by the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard, 2010 to 2020. And they tracked 160% increase in higher earning rental households making more than 150K, 26% increase in renters who are married, and almost a 40% increase in renters that are over 30 years old. So I guess the, the, the takeaway is that these renters are electing to rent they're highly qualified to buy and they're affluent so as long as you build a relationship and you guide them to the right decision a lot of them the majority of them end up buying the house um, and, and all the statistics kind of bear that out one of the um, most i guess sexiest terms used in the past few months just in the industry at large is the idea of a virtualized transaction so mm -hmm. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that on the rental side, the rental transaction as a whole has been virtual um, even before COVID and it's gotten significantly more virtual during COVID. So everything from the lead sourcing to the ability to search for properties. And then once you identify a property, view a virtual tour um, of every room, every corner of the unit, then once a customer is finally ready to kind of take the next step, applying for a property it's during the tenant screening process, of course, signing a lease online and even post-lease signing, the ability to pay rent payments online 
all of that is done virtually. And because rentals are a smaller financial decision for, for renters, and it's a far more flexible kind of uh, living option, um, it's always been counter cyclical and, and not just me as a landlord, I've experienced my, myself leasing my properties being easier this year, but what we've tracked during COVID is the landlord community is offering significantly higher commissions to agents, up hundreds of percentage points across many markets. And they're also offering significantly more concessions to tenants, meaning they're offering, you sign a 12 month lease, you'll get a free month, two months, some cases up to three months rent. So, so the net of all of it is it's become easier and less time consuming for agents to service and close rental transactions. And it's become more lucrative at the same time because the commissions have gotten even higher. Um, kind of the last thing I mentioned before we dig into specifically the, the relationship with the MLS and where the challenges are, is there is another big pocket of value in being in the rental business, which is we talked about, I, working with the renter and the $12 billion in commissions and converting that renter into a home buyer, more than half of our database comes to us from these smaller mom and pops and smaller management companies. And those are a lot of them investors. And investors, especially in down markets, are more active in making acquisitions. I know that when the market is down, that's where I look closer into making um, more acquisitions. As a matter of fact, we had a webinar that you hosted, Marilyn, I know three months ago with Michael Zuber, who, who, was a, who was an investor in rentals from California. And I think he mentioned that he put in uh, 30 offers in the last 30 days when we were interviewing him. So building relationships with investors is a very frequent transaction that that agent gets many, many commissions. And of course you get two or three bites of the apple if you're then servicing these rentals as a property manager and potentially in, um, in, in helping lease these properties. So it's a, Kind of it's an annuitized business that um, that's very very steady so we want to we want to help agents capitalize and learn how to work with these investors and take advantage of the opportunity well so, you know, it's interesting too investors when you talk to agents a lot of times will tell you they're some of their best clients because there's there's no emotion in this deal right this is a this is a business transaction it's not oh my god the kitchen's not big enough or the backyard doesn't have a pool or you don't have any of that stuff it's just a financial transaction and you can do many more of them much more easily in some cases. Exactly right. But a lot of agents, you know, even when I look to purchase more investment properties in Boston, it's not, oftentimes it's not single family, it's two deckers and three deckers. And what if you want to buy like a small community? You need to speak a different language. And, and if, if the agent is only kind of versed well in single family, if you start throwing terms like calculate the cap table, the the cap rate on a specific, specific property or what's the NOI and how do I project rent roll? You, so we really try and educate the agent, give them not only the dictionary, but the know-how and the tools to service and cater to that investor population in a more meaningful way. So, so next, I think we're getting into MLS and what are the key challenges we've, we've identified speaking to, to a lot of MLSs around the country. And I think before we do that, we let the, we let the crowd kind of share with us what they think. Um, are the key challenges, and I think we have a poll question to to put up. Yep, that's up right now. So, what are what has been the greatest challenge to becoming a center of excellence for your rental market? Is it lack of visibility and access to inventory? Is it listing ingestion processes and the you know the data loaded with that? Is it documented commission payouts, or is it the rental day, data rental data maintenance and accuracy, or all of the above? It might be all of the above because these are all probably significant challenges. And I, I know I hear a lot from, from our MLS clients that um, it's just hard to attract people to put rentals in, into the system. And again, the idea of the, the payout and the, the commission structures and things like that are sometimes a little more difficult. And so people kind of give up on it. So it's nice to have someone that can help you deal with all of that. So far, it looks like lack, lack of visibility and access to inventory is the number one, which makes sense. All right. We'll wait a little longer. We've got about 55% of the people that have entered. Maybe just another another 10, 20 seconds, and then we can jump in. I feel bad that I've been doing all the talking, so I look forward to getting Chris's input on on these challenges. Mm -hmm. So did, yeah, we, they, did we get the result? Yep. 
there just can you guys see it i see it really small so 53 percent lack of inventory mm -hmm. and came uh rental data maintenance and accuracy and then we have document commission issue and the listing ingestion got it okay yeah, it, makes, I mean, it makes rental data maintenance makes sense too because obviously mls is, uh, take great pride in making sure their data is accurate so yeah it makes sense that that's a concern too but go for it yeah so i mean when we partner with an mls ultimately what our goal is to create a reality where just like on the sales side if, you, if i have a house for sale i don't sit there thinking should i or shouldn't i have it in the mls it's a given i have to have it in the mls so how do we create a reality that lends itself to every rental in the market making its way into the mls so we've certainly um, worked hard to accumulate now nearly 9 million properties, but we think that the relationship is far stronger with the MLS. And these are the key um, challenges we've, we've identified. This is stuff that comes directly from the MLS executive we talked to. And by the way, they're not prioritized. It's just uh, kind of a running list. So okay. the, first, the first one here is just listing ingestion. So the idea behind this is if I want to input a rental property into an MLS, most MLSs, are gonna treat that listing similar to a sales listing, mm -hmm. both in terms of the way it's being put into the system, but also in, in the data dictionary that it captures, right? So it's problematic for two reasons. Number one, it's very cumbersome. When I put in a sales listing, there's a lot of questions I'm being asked that are completely relevant for a rental property. It doesn't capture a lot of the key data fields that are critical for rentals, and we'll cover that. But another very common thing on rentals is that I am representing a landlord or I have a property management. I have multiple vacancies at a time. So when I go to the MLS, I don't want to sit down and punch in 10 listings one at a time. That's going to take me forever. I want to be able to batch upload these listings. A lot of the property managers out there are using some software like Appfolio or RealPage or Yardi, and they just want to connect their feed to the MLS. So the ability to pull that information in in a very easy way, seamless way, and capturing all the right data points um, seems to be a challenge. And, and I, we've certainly faced and overcome that uh, within our platform, but... Um, yeah, well, I don't disagree with the poll results of the inventory being a challenge. I think this one definitely got a little bit of short shrift because when you really think about the effort that goes into um, inputting rental information, especially how quickly rentals move, I think that's something a lot of people don't give a lot of thought to necessarily, whether it's on the brokerage or on the MLS side, you know, typically you have a listing for you know, 30 days and another 30 to 45 days for closing. You're talking really long periods. You're going to rental transactions, 5, 10, 15, 20 in a day. Um, so spending any more than a couple minutes inputting that listing, you've really lost a lot of valuable time um, in your day for that. So I think listing ingestion, that is definitely to me, one of the key parts that makes the rental beast inventory so valuable is because you are providing that to these owners. And that's what keeps it more accurate than, you know, a typical competitor like a Craigslist, where they're really just kind of spamming one in there and then leaving it up there forever. So I would think this one, I would have voted, I still would have voted for the inventory, but this one would have been very close behind for me as a major challenge. Yeah, I mean, I know on our part, we have a very large team of people and technology we've built over the past decade to address it, but but it's... It's critical, and and you and you hit a good point. I'll just skip to point four. We don't have to go according to order. The, the issue of data maintenance. A lot of the MLSs I talk to, one of the key issues on rentals is, if I'm an agent and I sold the property, I rush back to the MLS to say it's under agreement and it's sold because it's important. It goes into my statistics. Um, there is an incentive to do it. When a rental goes under agreement, oftentimes the agents are not as proactive as keeping it fresh. So I hear a lot of MLS saying that they just end up purging the data after 30 days. So if you consistently go into the MLS and the data is just completely inaccurate or outdated and it's not actionable, it becomes useless and, and, it, and very quickly deteriorates and, and the MLS ceases to be kind of a source of truth in the key marketplace. So when we look at maintenance of data on rentals, you just mentioned that, Chris, the shelf life of a rental property is often counted in hours. We don't think about days or weeks or months. We can get a property into the system in the morning that's rented in the afternoon. And that's very different from the sales side. So again, most MLSs are geared towards a push system only. You put information in, and then it's totally on the agent to manage that information once it's in there. 
we have a pull push system with a ton of technology sitting on top of that, a lot of manpower sitting on top of that, um, that really tries to proactively um, update and keep the, the, the information and the listings as real time as humanly possible to make them usable for agents. Because again, it's not an ad website. It's not a Craigslist or, or, or you know, you have these consumer sites that attract a tremendous amount of traffic and might have tens of thousands of listings, but they're less focused on, is this particular unit available this particular minute and can an agent show it to someone or not? Um, it's more of a lead generation engine. And on that data maintenance, um, one of the things that we've talked a lot about is what agents want to close up transactions because they want the recognition and the production credit. They want that to show up in rankings and reportings, be able to use that for CMAs. Uh, and rentals often don't fall on those because they don't have the same level of reporting that uh, the traditional for sale side does. So one of the things that MRED is doing as part of our overall you know, commitment to help, helping make the rental market grow in our area is we're enabling this uh, new status called comp status. I'm sure that other MLSs already have this now, but it allows a, an agent who represents a buyer or in this case, a renter, and is working with an unrepresented seller or landlord on the other side to still be able to input that closed deal into the MLS to get credit for it, to get production for it. Um, and there were ways to do that before for us. It was a little bit more challenging. So we're trying to make that easier. And as I said, it's not an original idea by MRED. We saw other MLSs doing it and decided to borrow that as we do so well. Uh, but it, what we want to make sure is that if you're an association, like say the city of Chicago, who does focus on rentals and hands out rental awards and talks about who the top rental agents are, that we are capturing all that production in the MLS so that way you can have the right information for your sales awards and your rental awards there. So on the MLS side, association side, think about it from a production and recognition standpoint and how rentals can maybe help build that out a little bit more for you too. Yeah, and that's great. Yeah, it's it's really important to kind of complete the ecosystem, and that's kind of part of working together with an MLS. Like you encourage the agent to do the right thing, you have the right tools to pull in the the the, the landlords, the property managers, and the agents to post, and then you keep the data fresh and it becomes usable. Um, speaking of usability, search. So the search terms, and it kind of ties into data dictionary, so we can knock out those two points at the same time. A lot of the sales listings. And I know that MRED added a few fields and I spoke to, um, I think it was Central Texas last week and they added a few fields, but there is certain fields and it, it's so much beyond just adding fields, but there's, there's a lot of fields that just don't exist. For example, if you're working with a renter and they're looking to move on September 1st, you need to search by moving date and that's a concept that really doesn't exist on the sales side because a property becomes yours the day you close. There's no concept of a moving date. If you're working with a tenant that has a, a cat or a dog, again, when you buy a place, highly relevant because you're going to own it and you can put whatever pets you want in it. When you work with a tenant that has pets, every rental property has very specific pet policies, whether they accept them, don't accept them. Even if they do accept them, there is often additional deposits per pet, weight restrictions, breed restrictions. Uh, you want to account for that. Talk about concessions being something that now changes daily. If I'm working with someone and the property they're interested in is offering three three months rent or two three months rent, that's kind of a big deal, right? Because it can save them thousands of dollars. I need to be aware of that. Uh, even the commissions. I mean, the commissions are not necessarily tracking to the way sales commission gets paid. It's not, unless you're in New York, it's often not a percentage of the overall sale. So it's a month's rent on average around the country, but sometimes there is bonuses on top of that. Sometimes it's 100% of first month's lease, sometimes it's 50%. So um, even the language around the commission payout is, is very, very different. So you wanna be able to search through it properly, which is an interface we, we offer uh, or can offer within the MLS, and it helps you navigate and make the data significantly more, more usable. And you wanna capture those listings um, from the get-go, again, which we offer our listing ingestion engine to the MLS, um, with the right dictionary. So, so the data comes in properly from, from the beginning. Oh, Chris, question for you that just came in. Um, one other thing that I've heard this before too, that sometimes um, MLSs get concerned about dealing with rentals because of the rules and regs regarding them and the data accuracy requirements and things like that. How do you deal with the different, you know, Isha just pointed out some unique 
differences, and I'm sure there's many others, but how do you deal with that from a rules reg and a regs perspective within MRED? It's a great question. And honestly, when um, when you look at this, it's actually very similar to dealing with commercial properties in that ultimately what we end up doing is slapping not just uh, listing input, but rules, regs, and all the other things that we treat residential on a rental. Um, so I do think that if you want to really support the rental market, there needs to be a concerted effort in thinking about how the rules need to be different too. And it starts with the fields, like I said here, and making sure that you have the right data coming in. But then when you have that right data coming in, you do need to adjust those rules as well. I think um, we're probably like most in that our rules really are not that different from residential to rental. And they really should be. There should be more specific uh, business practices in place there to account for the speed that it happens, to account for the different terminology, and also to have a little bit more um, little bit more input coming back in from the field once these rentals are done. So I do think that, you know, the data dictionary piece that you should have mentioned to me is a really fa fascinating piece. We do have rental terms in our search, but they're intermingled with everything else. There's not a specific rental section within listing input. So you can do a residential search, but ultimately it's still kind of mixed in with everything else. Um, and I think if, uh, you know, that's something that Ishai has talked about with the real estate standards organization to have a rental collection that's really much more built out to really think about it. I think it's a good place to start because then we get the data correct and then we can move on to the rules and regs around it too, so. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, uh, moving moving on to kind of the next set of challenges. The top one was the top one for, for, for this crowd and obviously what we, or certainly our team and myself have dedicated our life to, um, literally, and that's access to inventory. So the reality is, this is no secret, the vast majority of rental inventory does not make its way into the MLS. It's not represented by individual agents. It's out there as what we call open listings, um, represented by owners and property managers. And we've built a machine to capture it. And it's hard. It's hard and it's expensive. Um, you know, yesterday we did a prep call with Chris and, and Embred is actually I would say light years ahead uh, um, of, of, of many MLSs in terms of what they've done on the rental side, because on any given day, they'll have thousands of active rental listings. A lot of MLSs out there either don't have rentals at all um, or have a very relatively, you know, very small amount of, of, of rentals in the MLS. And uh, and even in MRED's territory, Chicagoland, I think Chris kind of did kind of cursory search and in the primary Chicago market, they had something like 8,000 or so active listings. And by doing kind of the same apples to apples search yesterday, Rental Beast had, I think, 17 or 18,000 property mm -hmm. that, um, that are just not in the MLS today. So, um, and, and, and all, all the listings in our system are not. So kind of more than double the inventory. And if you break it down to specific neighborhoods, sometimes it's 2X, sometimes it's 5X, sometimes it's 10X. And the other neat thing about it is because the inventory comes to us directly from the owner or the property manager, whatever is the available commission offered to the agents, the, the agents get to keep 100% of that. In other words, when, when, a, when you have a listing agent um, working a property, they offer a percentage of the commission that the landlord offers them back to the uh, tenant rep. And in our case, there is no, you know, we capture the listings directly from the owners, so whoever represents the tenant um, gets to keep 100% of the commission. So, um, you know, it, it, it's just a lot of, I think just, just on those listings we looked at, there was something like uh, 15, 25 million available rental commissions right there on, mm -hmm. on, on that active inventory. And of course it turns over almost daily. So there is hundreds of millions of dollars in commission just in that one kind of greater Chicago land area every year. Um, the rental commission issue, that's a tough one. I mean, we we basically had to build a semi-manual process where every landlord, every property manager that inputs stuff into the system, sometimes they have it formatted where they say, this is what we offer agents, uh, plug it into your system. If they wanna get paid, sometimes there is form requirements. Sometimes they have to send a certain uh, type of invoice, fill a W-9, whatever the agent needs to do, in order to get paid and exactly how much money does that agent get paid is documented on each individual property and guess what when we work with an mls and and and, and we're kind of together as a team already the rental beast team is wired and trained to basically sell these landlords um, there's no other way to put it on paying higher commissions to agents 
and engage mm -hmm. the aging population in a more meaningful way. And it's working. And oftentimes you'll see a property in our system that say rent will be special, meaning because we introduced them to the concept of getting effectively white glove service by real estate agents, um, they're willing to pay extra for it. Because think about it, you're a real, and I'll, and I'll put my landlord hat on. I'm a landlord, I have a vacancy. I'm not required to give an exclusivity in order to put my listing in because I'm working with rental beast, right? So I put my listing in and what you're getting asked in return is you're gonna get all these agents to pre-qualify leads for you, bring the client, show the client, help you process the application, help you put the lease documentation together, everything you need. And if you, if you agree to accept that tenant, you have to pay them a commission and it's, it's very often an easy yes. So, um, so it just presents a lot of commission opportunities. So Isha, we have an interesting question that came in from Stephanie in Las Vegas. She said, how is the commission guaranteed if they are not, and I assume she means the landlord or the owner, are not members of the MLS and are required to abide by the code of ethics? So how do we know mm -hmm. that our agents don't get our, we don't get them in trouble somehow? First of all, hi Stephanie. Second of all, um, uh, so, so the answer is twofold. First of all, factually, we've been around about a decade, um, thousands of agents through the system, probably hundreds of thousands of transactions. I can count on two fingers times where something was advertised and the agent didn't get paid. The, the reason that it gets policed, so to speak, um, on the rental side is the agent controls the money. What do I mean by that? We have a listing, the listing says the landlord pays you one month's rent when you sign a lease. Before you set up a showing, the agent confirms that with the landlord. Then you show that with the client, you confirm that with the landlord. Your client is now interested in processing an application. Before they process an application, the agent confirms the payout with the landlord. Now, if your client is approved, it's the agent that collects the first month's rent, if there is a last month's rent deposit. So before that money changes hands, before that lease gets signed, there is five or 10 touch points between the agent and the landlord to allow the agent to ensure that they get paid the advertised commission. And it just works. I mean, we, we certainly don't have the, um, the oversight structure that MLSs have on the sales side, uh, but it's, um, it's just, I mean, I guess the short answer is the dynamics of the transaction lends itself to a point where the agents get paid the advertised commission. And in the one, literally one, and I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands of transactions that it doesn't happen, we just blacklist a property and make sure that we notify, you know. Mm -hmm. no, to no, support no. that, yeah, to back that up, um, Isha and I actually know each other back from my brokerage days. So the many years goes back way before MLS even, and we had a rental division in our brokerage. And that's exactly what would happen if a landlord decided they didn't want to pay or tried not to pay. And this had nothing to do with rental beasts at the time, just normal rental transactions. They knew mm -hmm. that if they did that, it was going to be very difficult for them to get agents to bring any of that back to them. And agents are probably one of the best sources of marketing that a landlord can get for rentals. Um, and that goes back to the access to inventory. As Isha said, we've got you know 50% roughly on the MLS here. But what, where do you find that other 50% as a renter or as an agent? And I think that's why a lot of agents have difficulties really going after rentals because it's not just that it's a relatively quick transaction that maybe doesn't pay as much as a sale. It's also that finding the inventory is really, really challenging if you don't have all of this in one place because you're going to you know, four or five, six different sites and you're probably still not seeing everything out there uh, because there is no MLS on the rental side until Rental Beast came along to collect that and aggregate that inventory. So... I think those two actually go together in a lot of ways in that the inventory is being pulled in, but then yes, we don't have an agent on the other side adhering to the code of ethics, but what you do have is a landlord who doesn't want to lose out on a source of marketing and source of income. So pr practical, practical, practical code of ethics. They have to, you have to do it or you're going to be out of business. Exactly. Um, there's another interesting question that came in from Suzanne. Um, she said, will you be addressing or do you address short-term rentals? Uh, she's in a more of a luxury market, or, or a, I should say a second home, you know, resort market. Uh, she says she has 85 long-term rentals, but she has 450 short-term rentals. So does the system cover both of those types of rentals, more vacation rental type stuff? We don't do vacation rentals, no. I mean, there is a couple of small outfits you may have heard of, like Airbnb and VRBO, that 
effectively own that that market. <laughs> So there's just no way, first of all, there's no need because they do a great job at aggregating the data and, and facilitating transactions. Um, so we, we work very closely with Airbnb um, to facilitate short-term rentals for the millions of owners that are in our system that want to put some or a portion of their inventory up as short-term. Mm -hmm. um, but we personally don't catalog. It's a totally different business. And, um, you know, we, we, we specialize in regular rentals, usually 12 month leases, but it goes down to, you know, there are some, a lot of the bigger buildings offer three to six months options. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we consider short term, but, okay. uh, but nothing like nightly or weekly. That's not, that's not what we do. Gotcha. And uh, Lisa has a question. Um, is rental beast available in all markets today? So even if an MLS doesn't have a relationship with you, are there still, individual agents and owners that are participating in the in the platform yeah i mean we we have data in all 50 states we're active in 17 we'll be active in six more in the next 60 days and we, we the short answer is yes even and if we're not in the market if we talk to an mls and a partnership makes sense the way we're set up is that we can have critical mass of inventory and have the system ready on a 30 to 40 day kind of time frame and usually we we bake into our um, kind of ramp up integration agreement 60 to 90 days. So it leaves us enough time, even if we're kind of starting at point zero, which we're probably not, to to kind of get to a really good spike by the time we we, we take the program live inside that particular MLS market. Are there times when someone may enter a list a rental listing into the MLS and not into Rental Beast? And if so, do you do you feed from the MLS into Rental Beast? I guess that's we do. a good question. I don't know. You do? Okay. Well, the, the idea is for the integration to be symbiotic. So if somebody wants to put in a listing, they have to go into the MLS. They might be using our listing ingestion engine, but mm -hmm. the listing is effectively being put into the MLS. But from day one, we certainly bring in all the non-off MLS inventory. And on an ongoing basis, we're constantly trying to find and increase the inventory until we get as close as we can to 100% of total rental inventory in that in, in, in any respective marketplace um, gotcha. but, yeah. but yes i mean we we want to create a, a reality where you have 100 percent of the inventory so if, to the extent there is inventory listed by agents we bring it in and then we bring everything else in as well uh, here's now a question point, yeah go ahead chris I, was another question. That point, I mean that's um, a big another big part of the reason why i think it's so important that if we have that kind of rental collection that goes through reso that's why MRED would definitely be one of the first ones to implement something like that because then the feed we send to Ishai is more accurate to what he needs as well. So it's just, it makes more sense. It's about making the data easier to flow from one system to another, making it more interoperable, which is all the things MRED and Riso and everyone in the industry should be all about. So. And, and Chris, do you envision a time when you would stop taking in uh, rental inventory into the regular MLS and only use Rental Beast as your d default tool for that? Um, I don't know whether that would ever happen. It'd be interesting to see if Rental Beast got big enough. That'd be a good conversation to have. Uh, mm -hmm. That's quite a ways off just because it's hard for any one product to take over a market completely, right? Even though he's probably further along than anyone by far. Um, mm -hmm. it's still, there's always going to be a need, I think, for outlying areas to um, have that input. Or maybe people are just more comfortable inputting it into the MLS because then it becomes more almost at that point, like a system of choice, front end of choice, you know, the conversation we've had about MLS platforms and how you input your listings. I mean, I feel like that is a very similar idea here. And maybe they just like the Connect MLS version better here in Chicago. But we still want to make sure that data gets in both places. So. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the, la the last point is the demand for virtualization. So I think that there are certain core competencies that MLS have, but you know, I think somebody mentioned, maybe it was Chris earlier, that in order to attract the inventory, you have to have a very serious value proposition. And it can't just be, hey, you can put listings here, right? Um, and, and we've built that value proposition over a really long period of time. And what you end up getting is an end, a truly end-to-end -end leasing transaction that could be done totally virtually. So tenant screening, which was the first kind of piece we rolled out with MRED and the ability for somebody to stay compliant with FCRA, 
deliver a comprehensive credit report, background check, eviction history, detailed rental application, system that's smart enough to identify whether the application that goes to the listing agent potentially initially needs to go to some other owner. In Chicago specifically, for example, there is special rules for Cook County that are not applicable for other areas of the Chicagoland, and, and this, you need a system that's sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. We had uh, in Chicago buildings where the landlord approves the application, but then it needs to go to the condo board for a secondary approval. So really having a tool that helps you very quickly close a transaction, keep everybody in compliance and keep the agent in the center of it. Signing a lease online, collecting rent payments. I mean, I can tell you as a landlord, two years ago, before I started using digital rent payment collections, every month I was waiting for paper checks. And to this day, I think 60, 70% of the smaller landlords in this country are collecting rent via paper checks. And it's the number one pain point because they need that money to pay their mortgage, to pay their bills. It never comes exactly when they need it. It always comes sporadically if you have multiple units. So having a tool that easily puts the money straight into your account, you know, exactly the date the money hits, at the end of the year, you can press a button and it issues the, the right schedule for your accounting on your rental income. And from a tenant's perspective, not having to lick envelopes. And if you have a bad month and you're, you know, you want to use your credit card, the ability to do that, it's also a, a really easy convenience. And then a bunch of other stuff. I mean, we, we syndicate those listings out. I think I had a conversation with an MLS on the West Coast and they have a lot of property managers there and they don't want to go and syndicate to one portal and then a second portal and then a third portal and have 15 different relationships that they have to manage. They want to go to one place that syndicates it out to everybody and control third-party syndication. Um, so all of these tools are kind of baked into the platform to really um, facilitate the totally virtual transaction. And I think people are appreciating virtual more nowadays than they may have even just four or five months ago. For sure. Hey, um, Chris, we've got a question from Michael for you. Sure. He said, could we have Chris talk through the workflow again from an agent's perspective, particularly as the two, how do the two systems work together? The oh. MLS and rental beat, how, how, do, how does it, how does it, if I have a, a listing or I want to participate in making money on this, how does it work? So that's actually um, a nice addition to the, the other barrier to entry that I wanted to add here. And I'm glad that you should mention the apply now uh, process that they have in place, the online application, because for us, one of the major things that drove us to talk with Rental Beast was actually concerns around liability and compliance to uh, various local legislative statutes. And for us, what we were really concerned with was our agents, our members, handling personally identifiable information on behalf of landlords and right. handling that kind of stuff that's just begging for problems. Um, so what's really nice about the, the, the system that we have in place with ESHI right now, the partnership we have, is that application process keeps the agent in the loop. They know where that's at, they know that it's been filled out. So essentially how it works to talk through the workflow is you look up a rental in Connect MLS, which is our MLS platform, and there's an apply now link. You click on that link and it'll auto-populate from our system Things like the property information, agent information, if we have the landlord or owner information, it puts that in. And then what you do as the agent is you fill out anything that's missing, including your applicant information. So this would be you representing the tenant in this case. That mm -hmm. then creates an email that triggers out to the tenant, and the tenant is the one who actually fills out the application and pays the money in okay. that um, So they're gonna be charged whatever the fee is. This is actually, um, I'm not sure how it works in many of your other metro areas, but it's a common business practice here that whatever you pay to whether it's rental beast or a similar application system there's a really healthy margin in um, bumping up that price uh, there's you know down here in the city of chicago you can pay anywhere from 75 to 125 dollars an application and i can tell you that it's nowhere near that cost <laughs> to actually run that through the different credit bureaus so it's a great uh, revenue center for many people and that's how they treat it as such because the application is the application, whether they get approved or not, you still collect that fee. So then what happens is the uh, tenant fills out the application, that triggers a notification to the agent and to the landlord, and the landlord is the one who's going to get that final report. And the report itself is not just you know, a judging of the credit, it really is a very nicely put together marketing piece helping the landlord decide about the worthiness of that candidate. So um, I think it, it really does a great job of making the agent look very professional in the process of 
especially if the agent's representing the landlord, but also for the tenant coming in, it helps them be a stronger tenant because it's almost like, as Ishai said earlier, you're pre-qualified, you know, just like we would with mortgages today. So that's how our process works right now. And then uh, we got started there because that was our biggest need at the time. And then what we've also talked a lot about is how do we start including more of that inventory as part of the search process? So right now you search the 50% that's available on the MLS. How do you get access to that other 50% without pushing those agents to the multitude of other sites that are out there? Um, so we've talked about some different integrations we can have within our search page, uh, mm -hmm. specifically around the rentals that would drive you to a white labeled version or a partnered version of the site. You know, it could be either one. So if you're concerned about your agents being unsure that they've gone to the right place, there's certainly opportunities to do some co-branding to make sure that you're still there and in partnership with Rental Beast. But for us, it does make sense, I think, to have that step off into Isha's platform because it is more focused on rentals. And that brings up my second point that I think is a big barrier to entry. One of the things we talk about a lot at Emred is core competency. And all of the things that Ishai talked about here, yes, you could probably hire developers and spend three or four years trying to build it out yourself and hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, but is that really what you want to do? as an MLS when it's already out there working really well and running at a high speed. So to us, it made sense. We know this is a market. We're big believers in the CMLS making the market work concept. This is a huge part of that market and we wanted to try to address it. It made sense to partner with him in that respect. So for us, that's uh, where we're at today and what we're thinking about in the future. We've also talked a lot and I know you have a slide later so I won't steal too much of the thunder about some of the market statistics that can maybe come out of some of these rental trends that might be of a lot of interest especially if you have another change in the market like we had several years back uh, where the rental market takes a lot more precedence over the sales market. So we're, we're quickly running out of time, Ishai. So why don't we, we'll stop talking for a minute and just let you, t just give us an overview. What does Rental Beast do? I think we've gotten some good perspective, but give us a, give us a quick demo here, a quick overview. Yeah, I'll just I'll just run through it quickly and leave time for more questions. So so kind of at the heart, as I mentioned, of what we do is this database that now has nearly nine million listings that are not on any MLS. Unique uniqueness of the data set is that all the properties are coming to us directly from the owners or the property managers. So they come from the source. We work hard to include what we say is transaction grade data on each property. So it's about 50 data points on each individual property that truly allow an agent looking at it, physically visit the property, sign a lease and collect the commission. And then the next step, of course, and, and the third, third unique thing is the level of maintenance done on that data. Uh, we're really proud of, and it's actually harder than the listing acquisition process is keep, how fresh we keep the information. Um, then once a, a customer is ready to move forward, uh, Chris just talked a lot about the, the, the process of applying for a property and closing the transaction. Um, on the other side of it, we have a virtual assistant and basically a, a lead generation tool. So think about 9 million listings being syndicated. We have all kinds of unique syndication partnerships. For example, we're, we're one of only five companies syndicating our inventory to the Facebook marketplace and you know, with the realtor.com and a bunch of others. So you are able to generate demand and circulate that to agents. Also, agents themselves have the ability to take our inventory and market that kind of one click post it to highly trafficked sites. Uh, we have what we call passive lead generation where we built this consumer interface really geared, specialized on consumers looking for rentals, giving them specific search tools to search for rentals. Um, and then once the lead comes in, the agent has all kinds of lead pre-qualification -pre filtering, um, filtering systems to really kind of navigate those listings. And ultimately all of that is tied to a university um, and, and, and the reason being is there's a lot of we think missing education on teaching agents how to service rentals, convert renters to home buyers, work with investors. So we have an entire university we call Rental Beast University. Don't ask me how we came up with the name. Um, but just available to agents at all times um, and we even have our own coaches that kind of can handhold agents. And in some cases um, when we partner with brokerage firms or MLSs we even add compliance training. Um, to that, because in some states and some municipalities, it's it's required. This is just a quick screenshot of our search interface, which could really go inside any MLS just to give people a flavor. We really try to design it like an MLS, but include. So think about it: somebody goes to the MLS, they want to search rentals instead of sales, 
And now they're getting relevant search fields like availability dates, um, are the owner paying me fees, even what is the minimum commission that I get paid on the property, specific parking, specific pet policy, all kinds of features and amenities and building types. If you only want to rent a single family versus a high rise, what type of amenities and services you want the building to offer. So questions that really kind of go to the heart of what's in a rental um, are included in the, um, in the search. The application, you know, there's a lot of tenant screening products in the marketplace. So what makes this unique, the reason we decided to make the effort and spend the money on building it from scratch is, first of all, it's very simple for the agents to use. It's literally a one pager. Um, no, not, not the name names, but uh, in, in one of the previous brokerage firms that, that we partnered with, I took a course on tenant screening on a different product. It literally took a course to teach me how to do it. So we really wanted to create something where one pager, you put in the street address, the applicant's information, you press submit and the agent job is done. Stays in control, notification system inside, you have a dashboard that shows you every progression of the application and there is email notifications throughout as well. The university, I mentioned courses available online. Um, we, most of the courses are designed boot camps, um, so not recordings like this to listen to somebody like me speak for an hour, but 15 to 20 minute tasks that make the agents actually take, do stuff. Um, and through doing these uh, um, tasks, they actually learn the business and they learn how to use the product. And then on the on the data services side, Chris mentioned, so just like when, if you, all these listings, they have 7,000 agents um, or 7,000 listings in MREC today, that means there is 7,000 landlords or property managers that are being represented by Chicago land agents. And when they need to provide guidance, just like on somebody that you're gonna sell their house, here is how much your house is gonna be worth for sale. How do you provide that guidance on a rental in a super professional way? So we've developed our own rental AVM that allows the agents to do that and really deepen their relationship with these landlords and investors. And they can show them exactly, here's how much rent you're gonna collect, here's how many days each unit is gonna stay on the market. And on the MLS level, we wanna position the MLS as a thought leader and a market leader on the rental side as well. So we wanna issue these reports monthly or quarterly to say, here's what's going on in the rental market and kind of complete that cycle of, you need to bring the, the, the inventory into our system, and we are sharing the data with you because we are kind of the, the largest aggregators of that. So in a nutshell, spent a few hours on the product, but that's in a nutshell kind of who we are and what we do. Well, that's awesome. A lot, a lot of, we've, we've already had a lot of great questions. There's a couple of... Uh-oh, Marilyn, you lost your internet? Well, while she's coming back, I do just want to echo, I'm glad you brought up Rental Beast University. I think one of the things that's really hard to understand until you start really diving into rentals is just how different of a transaction this is and how much education you need outside of the residential sales process. We have an so, answer. Let me um, let me bounce back to those real quick. Uh, Heather? If you tell Marilyn, we can't hear. So how many emails is you're working with? Sorry. So we're Can you hear me? To yeah, I can hear you now, but you came in and out, but I see the chat. Um, the question you asked is how many MLSs we're working with? Yeah. And the answer is we're currently engaged with about mm -hmm. 30 of them. Uh, so MLSs, while we've been around for a decade, as Chris mentioned, we started with Enterprise Brokerage and uh, Emirate was our first MLS that launched, I think, August of last year. Mm -hmm. And um, and we're engaged with about 30 MLS at the different stages. So there's going to be a bunch of, uh, I guess, a bunch of them coming online, um, you know, in the coming weeks. But that's, that's our MLS. Um, Marcia, Marcia asked a question. Can you hear me now? Am I, are my yes. mouth, is my mouth moving and you're hearing words come out? Okay, good. <laughs> um, she asked, is, there, is it possible for someone to put a listing in where an agent would not get a commission? Is there, is there always a commission attached or can there be some where there's no commission? No, nope, there can be some. With, we want to get 100% of the inventory, so mm -hmm. you know, there, there could be some where there is no commission. It's very easy on our search to filter through it. You just okay. check a box that says only show me the ones that pay. The value of bringing those listings in anyway is oftentimes whether you're working with a real client or maybe it's just a perfect property for somebody that you know is going to buy in three months. 
Um, or alternatively, uh, it could be somebody in between, you know, their house hasn't sold, so you're working on a sales transaction, so you have a guaranteed commission. So there's always value in having the access to the inventory um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of leave it up to the agent to, uh, to kind of navigate that and document the commissions. Well, it just creates a perception. It's kind of like a, a shopping mall, right? You want more stores there because it just creates more energy, even if, even if that particular one you don't want to sell. I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. I was just going to say, and it is about the relationship there too, between you as the agent and your clients, and you want to make sure you do best for them because as Ishai said, it's very unlikely that they're going to be a long-term renter. They're going to turn into um, a purchase for you at some point. So maybe you sacrifice a little bit in the short term to get them in the long term. Uh, here's a good question that came in from Jeff. He, this is for you, Isha. He said, um, can you describe or just speak to any challenges that you've run into when you're working with, with the association owned MLSs when the landlord, in effect, the person on the other side of the deal, right, like we're used to, is not a realtor? Ha has that slowed down people or have they been able to get through that, that challenge, understanding that rentals are different? Um... I just want to make sure I understand the question. So if you if you do a residential transaction, right, the buy, the buying agent and the selling agent are both in in most markets are both realtors, not not in Chicago always, but many times in most markets they are. Um, in this case, the landlord who's selling the property in effect, right, is not a realtor because they're a landlord, but the person that's getting the commission that's selling the property is actually a land, is is a realtor. Have you ever had any issues where the association says I can't facilitate a program where one side of the deal is represented by someone who's not a realtor? I have never heard that. That's a new one. Okay, gotcha. I've not, I've not bumped against it. Yeah. That has not been an issue for us either with our 15 associations. 16 as of yesterday. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> oh, congratulations! That's exciting. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that because that, that As that's matter not... of fact, I think I think there's a bigger opportunity for an agent to highlight because they're basically building a double-sided relationship. So when you work on a relationship when there is two agents involved, it could be a very nice agent and you can kind of understand the business, but it's a one transaction type of game uh, most of the time. When you're working with a tenant and a landlord, you're building a relationship with a tenant that's going to turn into a buyer. You're working directly with the landlord that in and of themselves could be potential sellers or buyers, or maybe one day we'll give you an exclusive right to lease. So you are the only professional in the transaction, driving the transaction. It empowers you to actually de derive more value of all, every conversation and every interaction you have. So that's how, how I always looked at my involvement in rentals as an agent. So the landlord, in effect, is the client in our in trying to translate it back to residential, right? It's not it's not a fellow transactor. It's the person that owns the property. So it's like the seller. It's it's different. Um, okay. Ellen has a question for you, Chris. She said, "How much education and marketing did MRED do around the integration between the two tools? I guess, and then how quickly did adoption take off? And yep. any challenges that you've had to overcome so far?" Well, we did a a decent sized uh, splurge at the beginning. And I will say from a challenge perspective, one of the things we did was we wanted to make very clear who pays for what and where. Because okay. we had a lot of confusion at the beginning about am I gonna get charged as the agent? Is the brokerage getting charged? The landlord getting charged? Uh, so luckily Rental Beast had great FAQs that we were able to link to. And we actually put that right next to the apply now process. Because we hadn't had that before, we wanted to have it basically in the workflow. So while mm -hmm. we have training and marketing materials that tell you all about it, it made more sense to have it right there where you're actually doing it because that's when you need the information the most. So I, gotcha. I would definitely recommend that to anyone when you build this integration in, put the instructions, the tutorials, that whatever you get from Isha and his team right there in the workflow uh, because that's where it's gonna be the most helpful. And so we got through that and like most MLS products, we did our initial launch and then we moved on and started talking about other things. And when we hit COVID, we decided, you know what, we really, kind of drop the ball on marketing this and we need to push it again. And we had kept a very steady pace up to that point, but as soon as we started just including it in you know, regular communication channels, we saw huge jumps um, in two months time. So it really is just like every other tool an MLS has, you have to mm -hmm. find a way to regularly remind people about it and about the opportunity to do it. Luckily with rentals, because they do, some, do move so fast, it's a lot easier to stay in front of an agent because you know with a listing tool, 
maybe they're only going to look at that once a month if on average they're only bringing in 12 listings a year so this one gives you a chance to be in front of them a lot more but you still need to have that conscious effort to talk about it um it can grow organically but mm -hmm. for us what really made it take off was we committed to making sure that it was part of our regular marketing outreach so Chris, I guess we'll give you the the final word here in terms of you, as a as a fellow MLSer, what what advice would you give to people that are considering looking at rental beast? Like, how, what, what's what, where do they go from here? Well, first of all, definitely schedule a demo and a call because I think seeing it in person, especially seeing the reports, uh, whether that's the application report, the market reports, the system itself, I think you'll realize the differences a lot more there. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe even take a spin through Rental Beast University to understand the different lingo and terminology there. So you can see what is going on. And then in your marketplace, if you don't have rentals in the MLS right now, like Ishai said for us, we already had that started. So it wasn't as much of a learning curve. But if mm -hmm. you don't, this is actually a fantastic opportunity for you to be a leader in the marketplace by having Ishai and his team teach everyone how to create a rental marketplace and create that rental business. Uh, that's something that we used him for when we're on the brokerage side to help mm -hmm. our agents get up and running and learn how to really create a thriving rental business. And it can definitely work the same way for MLSs. So that would be the two things I'd recommend the most is give him a call and get a demo, see it in action, and then make sure you think about how you can be a leader in your industry by really pushing this as a start of the relationship. Because we've talked a lot about the relationship marketing and Honestly, where your customer is usually beginning is renting. Very few of them just start off buying. So this is where you want to get them right from the very beginning. Gotcha. So rentalbeast.com forward slash MLS. That's where they should reach out, Ishai. And, and Ishai, any closing thoughts you want to share? No, I just really appreciate the time. In fact, that so many people took time out of their day to, to, to join the webinar. And obviously, um, lucky and fortunate to have a partner for a really long time and a friend in Chris. Um, you know, I, and just thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, um, a few of you have asked. This is being recorded, and we will be sending it out to everybody that registered for it. Uh, feel free to share this, and again, uh, reach out to rentalbeast.com forward slash MLS if you want to learn more about this. And if there's any questions you want to ask me, I, I think many of you know where I am too. Just reach out at Marilyn at Wave Group, and I'll be happy to help you as well. So. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Chris and Isha. I, I love what you're doing. I think this is a, a way, way overdue solution that every MLS can that has any kind of significant ML, uh, rental re volume can benefit from. So I love what you're doing and keep it up. Thank you so Thank much. You. And thanks everybody for attending today. Thank you everyone. Okay, bye.